thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. It's a long walk over from my office. <laughs> um, we turn to 1 John. I'm going to preach on the whole book, but don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole book. Uh, I just want to read the uh, opening five verses. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The title of the sermon is Light from Light, the Trinity in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now in these opening verses of his epistle, John seeks to sum up everything he has ever heard, everything he has ever seen, everything that he came personally into contact with about the person he wrote a whole gospel about, Jesus Christ. It's really a remarkable feat because that gospel of John, that 21 chapter gospel of John, ended with a confession that there's too much content in the reality of Jesus to ever capture and print or to cram into one book. That last verse of John is, now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the whole world itself could not contain the books that could be written. That's John 21, 25. Think about that. There's way too much to say, but he managed to cram the main thing into 21 chapters. And now it's as if somebody has pressed him and said, thanks for boiling that down to 21 chapters, John. Much more portable than a world full of books. But it's still a pretty long book. I'm a busy student. Could we get an executive summary of that? Is there any way you could say it even more concisely than 21 chapters? Could you leave out all the fluff and just state the big main point? Could you maybe get it down to about, I don't know, three words? Now John would be perfectly justified in saying to this imaginary uh, requester, no. After all, some things just can't be stated briefly. Some subjects require you to go along for the ride, to take the journey, to start at point A and walk patiently through B, C, D, E, depending on the professor, F, G, H, right, keep going, uh, until arriving at the destination. To summarize it would be to leave out the whole point of it, the whole purpose of it. Imagine asking a, a language tutor to tell you how to speak Spanish, basically, but just leave out the details, right? Seriously, how do I speak Spanish? Well, it's a skill and it's a process. You'll need a lot of vocabulary. You'll need some usage and some grammar and lots of practice. There are certain habits of thought you'll need to form. Yeah, 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 I'm in a hurry. Leave out that detailed stuff and just tell me the basic idea of how to speak Spanish. It doesn't even make sense. Like, you know not what you ask. No, no entiende, I can't do it. <laughs> I think that, was, that was my approach to learning Spanish. Some things, some of the most important things, resist being condensed and summarized. I think of the old one-liner from Woody Allen who said, I took a speed reading course and I read War and Peace in 20 minutes. It involves Russia. (laughs) Now at that rate, Woody Allen could complete the reading list for the Tory Honors Institute, not in four years, which we prescribe, but in a couple of days, with similar results for all the classics of Western literature. You can imagine it, the Iliad, big, big fight. (laughs) The Odyssey, dude goes home. Moby Dick, crazy captain chases white whale. Hilarity ensues. Paradise Lost, oops. (laughs) And so on, this is really helpful stuff. So John, could you just capture for us the most important things that we learned about God from Jesus? Well, In 21 chapters, he might reply, I can get the most important bits to bring about faith. Okay, great, I like the 21 chapters, now three words. Why didn't John refuse the challenge? What he has to say is really too rich, too full, and too exquisitely good to summarize, isn't it? 
Just look at the first four verses here that we read. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. You could summarize that if you wanted. In fact, I tried. Here's my summary of the first four verses of uh, 1 John. We proclaim to you something we encountered so you can share in it. Yeah? It took him four verses, and I think I did a pretty good job boiling it down. It's a pretty good summary and simplification. I worked pretty hard at it. I think I nailed it. I even wrangled the subject-verb-object relationship into a much clearer order than the original, right? None of this that which, that which, that which stuff. I said, we proclaim. Got the main verb right up there at the beginning. That's what you're supposed to do. I admit, I had to leave out a few details, like the noble progression and intensification of intimacy from hearing to seeing to really looking at something to touching it. Um, that, was, that was some nice stuff, and I, I did have to lose that. And I skipped over the whole word of life bit altogether, which in retrospect was maybe a mistake. And by cleaning up the word order, which really was an improvement, come on, that's good word order that I generated there, I, uh, I kind of obliterated the sense of expectation and suspense that John builds up, uh, that the author was really going for. I failed to mention, by the way, that this thing was in the beginning with the Father, which is probably a point I would want to make if I ever want to get to the doctrine of the Trinity in this sermon. In fact, the more I look at my summary, the less proud I am of it, and the more I think that the cost of simplification was really just too high. Oops. (laughs) To quote Milton. (laughs) Since we've already referred to several of the great classics of literary history, perhaps it's safe to refer to one more classic. That episode of The Simpsons where Homer has heart surgery, right, I thought... (laughs) Since it's Donut Chapel, I thought I could mention that. I mean, it's from season four, so that makes it really classic. Homer suffers a heart attack, and he goes to the doctor, and Dr. Hibbert says, Homer, I'm afraid you'll have to undergo a coronary bypass operation. You know, Dr. Hibbert always laughs, no matter what he's telling you, right? Homer replies, say it in English, doc. Hibbert says, you're going to need open heart surgery. Homer says, spare me your medical mumbo jumbo. (laughs) Dr. Hibbert says, we're going to cut you open and tinker with your ticker. <laughs> and Homer says, eh, could you dumb it down a shade? <laughs> no, sorry, Homer, that's as dumb as it gets. Right, that's as short as we can say, coronary bypass operation. If we leave anything else out, we've left out the heart of it, so to speak. So, <laughs> so my summary. We proclaim to you something that we encountered so you can share in it runs the risk of tinkering with the ticker of the letter to 1 John. But maybe it was clarifying for you to hear that summary nonetheless, that super short version. Sometimes a short, blunt summary simplification is a really good tool. If, but if and only if, that's for the philosophers in the audience, if and only if the summary sends you back to the original to regather and re-experience all the richness of the real thing. Holding that little thumbnail sketch, we proclaim something we experienced in your mind, can help you keep going, keep your bearings through all the delayed gratification of that which we X, that which we Y, that which we Z. It reminds you that the verb is coming, just be patient. Uh, Sometimes if you're getting lost in the details, you do need someone to remind you it involves Russia. Then you can go back and work through all of those long names and people and places and characters and battles and events. You know, map is not territory they say. I don't know who says that. I'm a sociologist, I think. But while I was never tempted to move into a map and live there, uh, there have been times when I was awfully glad to have the map of the territory. Now, the joy is still in the journey itself. The delight is always in the details. But sometimes the simple summary sets you free to immerse yourself in the richness of the unedited reality of the thing itself. So, John accepts our imaginary assignment, and he gives us the whole thing in three words. He takes in the full scope of what came to be known and experienced in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and he says, this is the message what we've heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light. God is light. This little simple sentence, God is light, is not a direct quotation from anything. It doesn't occur in exactly this form in the Gospel of John or in any of the Gospels. We don't have any documentary evidence that Jesus said this sentence. We have no reason to believe that these words ought to be printed in red ink here. But John offers it as the compendium of the message of Christ, the super condensed summary of all that the apostles heard and saw and experienced and came to understand. A 19th century commentator puts it this way. The real essential meaning 
patent to every unprejudiced eye of all that Christ ever said and did is no other than that which is summarized and announced in the words, God is light. God is light, for to this end Christ was born and came into the world, that he might reveal the Father whom no man hath seen. And Christ in his whole life in word and deed reveals the Father. And yet this revelation of God as proceeding towards men is a revelation of God as light. Then the whole life of Christ, his person and work, must have for its one meaning the proclamation, God is light. It is indeed the representation to the senses, in a sense, the incarnation of the truth, that God is light. Now, when the Son of God had run his course, like a strong man rejoicing to run a race, when the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus were accomplished, and the apostles looked back on the perfect, life-changing, world-transforming revelation of God in Christ, that's when John said, the message we heard from him and proclaimed to you is, God is light. The ancient church had a nickname for John. They called him the theologian. You can see it in the old-fashioned title, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. I think that's what it says in the King James heading. Um, where divine doesn't mean he's God, but it means he's got a master of divinity. That's why we call that degree that. In archaic English, divinity means theology, and a divine is a theologian. The ancient church called John the theologian, and you can see why. He talks about God. That's what theologians do. In fact, he doesn't just rehearse the mighty acts of God and say what God does. He takes that next step and makes concise statements about what God is. Here in chapter one, it's God is light. In chapter four, it's God is love. John the theologian, John who ventures statements about what God is. Now, this is the word of God. But humanly speaking, John takes a risk when he gives out a statement about what God is. I mean, no sooner do we hear the statement like that than we are tempted to reverse it. You know, if God is light, surely light is God. But no, it's not a reversible statement. Light is not God because God is not just any kind of light. The light we live in physically, which reveals and clarifies and beautifies and enlivens everything around us, is not the light that God is. The light down here under the sun is the light that God made when he said, kind of predictably, let there be light. It's a little light localized in the heavenly bodies, the greater light and the lesser light, bouncing off of everything in the earth household. God created the light. And like everything down here in heaven and earth, it's relative light, it's conditional light. It's necessarily mixed with shadow. There are spots on the sun. It could always be brighter. You could always imagine getting a hold of the dimmer switch and cranking it up a notch or two. But God is light in an absolute sense. As John goes on to say, in him is no darkness at all. This light is light indeed. Clear, transparent, translucent, patent and open. As one commentator says, always and everywhere as far as its free influence extends. Robert Candlish says, the entrance of light, which itself is real, spreads reality all around. Clouds and shadows are unreal. They breed and foster unrealities. Light is naked truth. Its very invisibility is, in this view, its power. It's not seen because it's so pure. In him is no darkness at all, no shadow of turning, not a blush, not a secret, not a thing out of character. This is great and comforting news, especially to anyone who's labored under the terrible notion of a God who is light mingled with darkness, a limited God who has to cut compromises with darkness, a capricious God who might change his mind about his promises, a God whose character is so inscrutable that we can't take his word for anything, an unknown God who's not revealed to us and not transparent to himself, a moody God, a karmic God, a force that lives in midichlorians in the heart of Darth Vader and manifests as a light side and a dark side, bad news from bad gods. The true God is light, and all others are idols. And as John ends his letter, little children, keep yourselves from idols. So in utter contradiction to the whole swarming pantheon of lousy gods, John proclaims to us what he heard from Christ. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Darkness is absolutely incompatible with the God who is light, has no fellowship whatsoever with him. That's good news, amen? Yeah, but it's also bad news. What does a God like that have to do with me? I might be able to pull together a moral and behavioral resume that could qualify me to hang out with one of those down-market, off-brand, lousy gods. 
But this God, the God of Jesus Christ, is light. John draws out the implications immediately. We can't walk in darkness and have fellowship with God who is light, verse six. We can't say we have no sin, that's self-deceit, verse eight. We just can't say we haven't sinned because God says otherwise. And if we disagree with him, one of us is wrong, verse 10. Hint, it's not God. (laughs) So now what? How can we sinful creatures have fellowship with this God who is light and in whom there is no darkness at all? Once you've felt the weight of this problem, 1 John's answer is pretty obvious. It shows up not so much in the form of a structured argument, that's how Paul would do it. In, in John, it shows up as a set of key words that feature prominently in the book. Forgiveness of sins, 1-9. An advocate with the Father, 2-1. And that $10 theological word, propitiation, 2-2. Specifically, God's Son sent to be the propitiation for our sins, 4-10. We have a problem blocking us from fellowship with the God who is light. And John announces the solution to the problem. In fact, John actually proclaims both problem and solution at the same time. Probably because we couldn't bear to sit very long under the pressure of the problem. It'll make you crazy if you get too exposed to that um, challenge, that barrier to fellowship with the God who is light. So the God who is light rescues us from darkness. The Son advocates, speaks for us, takes up our case with the Father. The Father sends the Son as propitiation, and the one God who is light proves faithful and just to forgive our sins. That's good news, amen? Yeah, and it's not a trick this time. It really is good news with no bad news following. First John has a lot of other things to say about right doctrinal belief, especially about the Son of God, righteous conduct, and Christian love. Those things that John goes on to say are great things, necessary things, things that make for open fellowship with God, and walking in the light as he is in the light. They're essential tests of the truth of our status to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. But it's impossible, it's unthinkable, that they could solve the problem of how a God who is light with no admixture of darkness could have fellowship with us. That fellowship has to be announced from God's side, not by applying tests to our own conduct, character, or belief, but from God's side through advocacy and propitiation. And if the salvation has to come to us from God's side, then the Savior has to be on God's side. In fact, I would say has to be God. This is a proof of the deity of Christ from the nature of salvation. If salvation is some modest thing, then it can be delivered by some modest Savior. It can't be, though, if it's the great biblical salvation we're told about, delegated, dictated, jobbed out, or done by remote control. You can't bring it about yourself, No fellow human or group of humans could bring it about for you. No angel can carry it down from heaven. God has to do it, and Jesus did it. Therefore, Jesus is God. This explains the father and son language built into the letter of 1 John. The church father, Athanasius, unpacks it this way. A man by craft builds a statue, but by nature brings forth a son. The statue is made of statue stuff, you know, stone, whatever. But the son is made of... Father's stuff, whatever the father's made of, it's the same stuff. The God who is light has a son in whom there is no darkness at all. The God who is light said, let there be light, and the Son of God either shines with the kind of light that God is, in which there is no darkness, or the kind of light that God makes, which is mingled. If only God can bring us into fellowship with him, and the Son, as our advocate and propitiation, does that, then the Son must be God. It does explain why he was in the beginning with the Father, back there in verse two, right? In the fourth century, the Nicene Creed summed it up this way, saying that we believe that the Son of God is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Now to call the Son light from light is not directly biblical language. You won't find it here in 1 John. But you will find here a logic of salvation that demands a savior who is not of a different nature from the God who is light. At Nicaea, the church's theologians had to make a decision and render a judgment about that. To read the Bible rightly, we also need to render a similar judgment. Well, in my title, I promised you a trinity, and I know what you're thinking. Where's the Holy Spirit? I refuse to use the word binity in anything but scare quotes, but I do admit that we've only heard about the Father and the Son so far, so where's the third person? Well, I have reason to believe and to suspect that he's here from the beginning, but in terms of explicit mention, he is a late arrival to 1 John. 
He doesn't show up at all until the very end of chapter three. It's pretty much chapter four by that time. More about him is said there in chapter four. So let's look briefly at two things. First, why he isn't mentioned until late. And second, what is said about him when he is mentioned at last. I think John is being a wise teacher by giving us as much as we can handle at any given time. The early lessons of the book of 1 John force us to make these judgments about the relationship of the Father and the Son, one God. Now, that's quite a bit to chew on. Conceptually speaking, if you can resolve how there's a deep unity and an equally deep distinction in God, you've done most of the mental work. Um, I think John lets us bring that on board before introducing the Holy Spirit. After all, once you've got unity and distinction, or as classical Trinitarian theology would say, unity of substance and distinction of persons, but once you've got that unity and distinction in mind, you've crossed over, you, you've made the big move. If there's good biblical warrant then to recognize um, the spirit as divine and as a person, and there is, then you can simply add him, because the room is prepared. You've made conceptual space for um, anyone the Bible puts forward as a divine person, yeah? And there's only three options there. The Gospel of John follows the same pattern, I think even more obviously. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? You know, there's really simple little words there, but notice that he's forcing you to confront unity and distinction. So let me just get this straight. The Word was with God, yep. And the Word was God, yep. So let's say I had my son up here with me. I'd say, my, he's named Fred, so that's, I don't know if that's a heresy or what that is, but it's like, Fred is with Fred, that makes sense, but Fred is Fred. No, that doesn't make sense. You could send him away and just talk about yourself and say Fred is Fred, but then it doesn't make any sense to say Fred is with Fred. So back to John 1, 1 again, and you read it again, you say, so he's with God and he is God. Yeah, let me think through that again. And you pound your head against it and you think about it, gather up all your best theological friends, spend a couple centuries on it. Eventually, <laughs> you're gonna do the heavy lifting of recognizing unity and distinction right there. Otherwise, you're gonna just have trouble with that um, with that opening of the Gospel of John. And then, after that prologue, you move right into a Gospel where Jesus spends the next 14 chapters talking about his Father, constantly his Father, nothing but the Father this and the Father that, and the Son does what the Father says. I sometimes think they crucified Jesus to make him stop talking about his Father, right? It really is, um, it's, it's constant throughout there. Then around, and not much mention of the Holy Spirit, relatively little mention of the Holy Spirit, till about chapter 14, when he really starts showing up, and then he comes on strong, he all but takes over the Gospel of John at that point. I think there's that same movement of thoughts going on there. Spend a little time racking your brain about how the Father and the Son can be the one God, and then add the Holy Spirit once you've sort of um, recuperated, yeah? Um, it's the same structure in the Gospel of John as in 1 John. I think this is wise pedagogy on John's part because he's being led by the Holy Spirit to discuss the Holy Spirit in this way. There's an old Bible teacher who said, scripture is wise even in its silence. So it's wise in what it teaches, but it's also wise in what it doesn't teach. And for some reason, it doesn't teach in 1 John about the Holy Spirit until about chapter three, at the end of chapter three, almost chapter four. I think there's a reason the Holy Spirit's not talked about there, and one of them is it's letting you digest what you've learned about the Father and the Son. This is maybe a side note. Um, notice that if the Spirit gets less attention in 1 John, who wrote 1 John? Well, John, but divinely speaking, it's inspired by God as his inherent word. So the Holy Spirit himself has put less attention on himself in the first part of 1 John. Right? We don't really follow the Spirit or do the Spirit justice by running in there and saying, let's shout more about the Spirit all the time in verses where he's not. Let's cram him in there. He did a pretty good job writing the book, and he put himself where he wanted to be, around chapter 4. Um, we need not talk about the Holy Spirit constantly in order to be rightly honoring him. He runs a kind of a spotlight ministry for the Father and the Son. Right? I grew up in a Pentecostal church and a saying we had there was, um, those who talk the most about the Holy Spirit aren't necessarily the ones who have the most Holy Spirit. Right? Well, it's a rough kind of principle, but what do people who, have, uh, who are in the power of the Holy Spirit talk about the most? They talk most about Jesus, right? Because the Spirit, when he comes, will take of what belongs to Jesus and show it to the believers, right? And then Jesus adds, all that the Father has is mine. So the Spirit's in the business of bringing in the work of the Father and the Son. I think that's why the teaching on the Spirit doesn't show up till late. But secondly, once John does start talking about the Spirit, what does he say? 
It's really three main passages, so we can read them all right here. A practically exhaustive study of the full teaching of 1 John on the Spirit. Chapter three, verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. How do we know that God abides in us? Because God has given us his Spirit, and that's how we know. Here the Spirit is the source of our awareness and ownership of God's abiding in us. Look at chapter four, verses two and three. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Here the Spirit is the witness to the reality of Jesus Christ. Notice how he is spotlighting the Father and the Son. Yeah, that's what I said was happening based on his absence, his explicit absence from the beginning, and then once he does show up, he's in the business of doing that. Look at 4.13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he, God, has given us of his Spirit. That's very similar to what we read before, but look what he adds. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So as soon as the Spirit shows up, your attention is directed to the truth about the Father and the Son. By the way, that 4.13 is a pretty nice Trinity verse, or 4.14 is a pretty nice Trinity verse for you if you want to find all three persons kind of hanging out in one verse. It's nice and tidy. Sometimes they spread out and get several verses apart, but it's nice to have them all in one place. Gregory of Nazianzus, a fourth century father, late in the fourth century, says that to know God is to see light from light in light. Yeah, light from light gets you the Father and the Son, but how do you see it? In light, because God makes himself known, and the one who is within you, making you understand and believe and have faith in God and receive his promises, is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the business end of the Trinity, the completion and guarantee of the indwelling and reality of the Father and the Son in their unified work, the undivided Trinity. Now much more could be said, but I wanna end with an epilogue, and I hope it's edifying for you. At some point in the history of the transmission of the text of the New Testament, somebody, somewhere, somehow, introduced a little bit of extra text into 1 John 5. Look at it in your Bibles, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record on earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are one. But here's what some uh, earlier versions say. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are one, or these three agree in one. Well, if you've got a King James Bible, you can find that um, added text there. And if you've grown up on a King James Bible and I come to your church and say, "Um, I just read all the Trinity verses in the whole Bible and I don't read that one, you can kind of have a panic moment. What's going on there with that? They call that extra text in 1 John 5, 7 and 8, the Johannine comma. And it's a long story how it got there and some of it's speculative. I've read anti-Trinitarian books that breathlessly report this as a forgery, a power move, a lying insertion of church dogma into the text of scripture. It's a 1906 book, Trinitarian Forgeries, which is sure that an evil Trinitarian smuggled it in specifically so he could have a knockdown Trinity verse to, I guess, beat Jehovah's Witnesses with. Um, And that would be nice, right? When you're going round and round the hero verse, their reverse game with the Jehovah's Witnesses, it would be really cool to have one good knockdown verse to take them, kneecap them with. That's a violent metaphor, but to lead them towards recognizing the truth. Well, I don't think that this text is original to 1 John. And the vast majority of scholars and translations take it to be interpolated or added much later. But I also don't think it's a power move um, in the same way that uh, the more uh, skeptical scholarship does. I have a rosier and less political hunch about how it got there. Since I'm already confident that the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity and that 1 John teaches it, I don't need to scramble around and insert a killer verse. I think one of two things happened. I think the scribe was reading 1 John and having a great devotional time. He followed the Trinitarian logic of 1 John just as we have all the way to chapter five. And once the Holy Spirit showed up, the scribe got really happy and wrote a little devotional riff in the margin. Woohoo, three that bear witness in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then the next scribe copied it in and made it part of the manuscript. Maybe, I just totally made that up, but it could have (laughs) happened. The other option's a little bit darker. The scribe felt frustrated that John almost said the thing itself, but didn't make explicit what he had pressed so hard, but had pressed implicitly. 
And so the scribe gave in to the temptation to correct the apostle. God preserve us all from that urge. I think Charles Simeon of Cambridge said that we all have that feeling. You can feel it when you're reading scripture and you think, I wish Paul had said it a little differently because that would refute my opponents better. Like as soon as you have that sort of itchy trigger finger where you want to help him, just say it a little different, oh apostle, then you've got everything backwards and you're doing it wrong. So God preserve us all from that urge when the Bible doesn't say quite what we wanted it to be explicit about. That is, I think, has to be recognized as a work of darkness and it has no place in the service of the God who is light. So um, we can't find it right there, but I hope that what I've convinced you of is that the doctrine of the Trinity is in 1 John, but not in such a way that you can sort of crack open 1 John, extract the doctrine of the Trinity, and then throw the wrapper away. I hope that I've given you a hunch that if you go back in and experience the details of what the apostle says in 1 John, you'll see more there than you may have seen without the reader's guide offered by the traditional Christian doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a dense pack of information. It's got a lot of propositions that go into it and thoughts that need to be balanced with each other and a lot of judgments made about different passages of scripture. It packs a lot in. It's a blunt summary simplification of the meaning of scripture, of the whole message about God that came from the prophets and apostles because it came from from God through Christ and the Spirit. It's really short, Trinity, it's three syllables. It doesn't improve on scripture, God forbid. We don't extract the doctrine and discard the wrapper. The joy is still in the journey. The word of God is still in the words of scripture. The delight is in those details as the Holy Spirit delivered them, silences and all. But the doctrine of the Trinity is a simple summary that sets you free to immerse yourself in the richness of the unedited reality of the thing itself. Let me pray for us as we leave. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's by the Holy Spirit that we know that we abide in you and you in us because you've given us of your spirit. Lord, thank you that your apostles have seen and testified that you sent your son to be the savior of the world. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.